Welcome. We are so glad you're here. My name is Gail Prinsky, and I am a Mandela Washington Fellowship Reciprocal Exchange Awardee of 2019. I am looking forward to sharing our Bullets to Books program with you today. I want to thank the American Impact Award, Mandela Washington Fellowship, and State Department for making this pro program possible. Bullets to Books started from a meeting one evening back in August 2018. I met with Mandela Washington Fellow, Jock Abraham Thon, who was attending the Young African Leaders Summit in Washington, D.C. I never would have imagined that several months later, a team of four of us would travel to South Sudan to meet up with Jock and our team in Juba to begin efforts of filming and leading education and cultural exchange workshops. Today, you will meet the U.S. team and some members of our South Sudan team who will share experiences and efforts on Bullets to Books. Our presenters from the U.S. include Andy Trushinsky and Sean McLaughlin, my producing partners on the Bullets to Books documentary, and Cindy Oxberry, who co-led the education and cultural exchange workshops in Juba. Here we are with John Sebra, our public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy and champion who took great care of us. This was the first morning we were in Juba. Also presenting today are our South Sudan teammates, Lupai Samuel Kenyi, founder of I Am Peace and Mandela Washington Fellow in 2017, and Jock Abraham Thon, founder of Promised Land Secondary School and Mandela Washington Fellow in 2018. Jock is also the inspiration for Bullets to Books. This photo shows Cindy and me with our team on the first morning in Juba, Lupai is sitting on the lower left, Jock on the lower right. On Lupai's right is Scopus Ladau of Crown the Woman, Bingo Simon, a Juba Film Festival, and Jacob Bior Bull of Anna Taban. Like Lupai, Jacob was a Mandela Washington Fellow in 2017. You will also hear from Washington, D.C. based artist Stephanie Mercedes, who goes by the name. Mercedes, and South Sudan architect Moses Mawa. Following the presentations, we will have a discussion. Please feel free to add your questions to the YouTube comment field or via Twitter. And now I would like to introduce you to our special guest, the former ambassador to South Sudan, Ambassador Tom Hushik, for opening remarks. Well, thank you, Gail. I'm so honored and really excited that you asked me to participate in today's event. I first met Gail and Jock Abraham, whom you'll hear from a little bit later, while I was serving as American ambassador to Juba from 2018 to 2020. Our, our embassy in Juba had a very important mission, representing the world's oldest republic, the United States, to the world's youngest. Youngest both in terms of its nationhood and also in terms of its youthful population demographics. The challenges in South Sudan were enormous, ending, uh, bringing an end to the brutal civil war, allevi alleviating hunger and preventing the return of famine, countering widespread corruption and combating forced displacement, illiteracy, infectious diseases, and widespread poverty. Or I like to describe the mission in more positive terms. We were there to promote the kind of resilience needed to build a lasting peace or to help heal the trauma that had touched every South Sudanese family and to aid in building the conditions for development, good governance, and even hope. So as U.S. diplomats, we had very powerful tools to tackle these challenges. For example, high-level engagement and pressure to coax political leaders in the government and in the opposition to do the right thing, or the generous assistance programs funded by U.S. taxpayers to alleviate food insecurity and invest in health and education. Yet in my experience in South Sudan, as elsewhere during my diplomatic career, I found that among the most valuable investments embassies make were in cultural and, and educational exchanges, especially with the youth of our partnering countries. 
And in South Sudan, I wanted to point out the Young African Leadership Initiative Program, or YALI, which first gave Jock Abraham the opportunity to travel to America on a Mandela Fellowship, along with other young Africans. There, as Gail mentioned, he met Gail, who later came to Juba on a cultural exchange program of her own, a pioneer helping us at the embassy to reestablish these exchanges after a several year hiatus um, caused by security concerns. These low cost but highly valuable exchanges are a key part of what we call people to people diplomacy. They work to expand opportunities for future leaders and strengthen relations between South Sudanese and American people. So while I was always proud of our high level diplomatic engagement and the pressure to hammer out a peace agreement or funding humanitarian and development programs to alleviate human suffering and stave off the worst aspects of violence or trauma or poverty or corruption, by far my most favorite tool and the part of our work that always inspired me the most and gave me the most hope for South Sudan's future was promoting people-to-people -people relations. This is a low-cost, bottom-up, soft power approach that I believe will ultimately be the most effective and sustainable lever for positive and lasting change in the lives of our South Sudanese sisters and brothers. There are no magic formulas, um, at least I haven't found one, for tackling South Sudan's biggest challenges violence, corruption, poverty, trauma. I know our multi-million dollar programs and high level policy interventions, um, important as they are, will not succeed on their own. I came away from Juba more convinced and even more optimistic than ever that more people to people diplomacy is necessary, more community level interventions, building and reinforcing the resiliencies and providing individuals the opportunity, especially for youth of South Sudan. These are the kind of diplomatic interventions that will eventually bring hope, uh, prosperity, and a lasting peace. So with that by way of context, let's hear more about the particular example of people-to-people -people diplomacy, which resulted in Bullets to Books initiative. I'm sure everyone listening will be inspired by this effort, which has grown out of that initial acquaintance between Gail Prensky and her team from America and Jock Abraham and his expanding group of young community activists, advocates, and future leaders of South Sudan. So let me turn the screen back over to Gail and Jock Abraham. Thanks. Thank you, Ambassador. In addition to my being a Reciprocal Exchange Awardee, I am the founder of the Yudisha Kulturban Project, of which Bullets to Books is an initiative. The Kulturban Project explores issues of oppression and response through music and art. Its mission is to connect people through commonality, inspire creative response to persecution, and encourage freedom of expression and culture. We start with the story of Jewish performing artists called Yudisha Kulturban, which means Jewish Cultural Association, in Nazi Germany, and connect two current day artists around the world. In the summer of 2018, I became interested in South Sudan as one of the places to explore as part of our efforts on the Kulturban project, which miraculously led me to an introduction to Jock in Washington, DC. So Jock, Please tell everyone about yourself, how we met, and the vision and mission of Changing Minds from Bullets to Books. Sorry, uh, we're having some kind of audio issue, Jock. Um, maybe what I can do is just uh, start talking a little bit more about the meeting, and then hopefully Jock will step in as soon as possible. So, so when I met Jock at um, at the Yali Summit that evening. I was blown away. Uh, he walks into the room, this very, very tall person, and he I felt like I met an angel. 
And when we started talking about each other's missions and visions, it became clear that we had a strong connection. We believe so much in education and cultural exchange in finding peace and unity. And Jock, can you, can, is it, can you try talking? Hmm. I, I understand that the internet signal has frozen. Uh, so, Jock, I'm just going to keep talking and then you interrupt me at any point. What Jock told me about at this meeting was that he had started the Promised Land Secondary School a few years before. He and friends had built a, a few buildings on this campus he owns in Juba, made out of bamboo mud, concrete, but the problem was that the heavy rains, they would cause damage to these buildings. And so he needed help, he needed support to replace these buildings with permanent structures. He also told me about these children that he brought to the school. He went to church one day and he said the only thing necessary was for the parents to register their children. So he started with 250 kids and Promised Land Secondary School was founded. He also believes that it is through this education that he can raise up the children just like he in surviving genocide and massacres to become strong leaders for peace. So what I ended up doing was, I, I mean, I was just so taken with his story. I told him the story of what we do for creating programs that inspire peace in art and culture. And together we thought we have to work together so I immediately called up my colleague Andy in, in New York, and I told him the whole story that I heard from Jock. And he said, my God, we have to do a documentary film about him and his vision and help him. And I said, yep. But the other thing that I thought that we needed to do, if we were going to help Jock build these permanent structures, we had to find an architect. And so I called up a colleague that I knew at Mass Design Group up in Boston, Massachusetts, and he put me in touch with an architect in Juba, Moses Mawa. So I'm going to turn this over to Moses and ask him to now walk us through his vision and plans for the architecture design and construction at Promised Land Secondary School. Moses, can you can you try talking? Stand by. Hmm. I think um, what we can do is I can I can try walking. I'm sorry, I didn't know that I was going to take up so much of the screen, but I can walk us through uh, the plans if you want to bring up. There we go. So that's an aerial shot of Jock's Promised Land, and we uh, are now seeing some conceptual designs. But what Moses has done, we're going to phase this in. So ultimately, there'll be several buildings, but the first building that's been built, which you see here, it's under construction now, and it's called the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Building. And it will be a multi-use building for lab administration and classrooms. And I, it is now, uh, I, I believe the walls have been built and the kids can sit in there and have uh, some classroom instruction. But here you see 
the excavation of the land. Now, what we really need and we hope is that you all will understand how important it is for this permanent structure to happen. The Minister of Education came by just a couple of weeks ago and was so glad to see that this building was uh, was being constructed because he had threatened to close down promised land until now, which is super great. But we would love for all of you viewers to learn more about what Jock is doing and Moses is doing for Promised Land. We, we really uh, welcome support and we can tell you more about how to reach out to us later. I think now what we can do is hand this over to Andy and Sean and, and learn more about the story of Bullets to Books and what Jock is hoping to accomplish now and in, in the future. Hey, everybody. I'm Andy Trushinsky. I'm the director for the short documentary Bullets to Books. And I can't tell you how proud and happy I am to be here to explain to you this whole thing, that, <laughs> this gigantic organization that's formed off of one man's mission. So <laughs> we will we will figure it out. We'll get to Jock eventually, Jock and Moses. But um, uh, I just want a quick little background. Gail had mentioned that uh, we came up with an idea together that we had to get this story out there. But in order to do that, <laughs> I needed to find someone also who could do some of the videography, some of the cinematography photographer in that. So I reached out to my friend, Sean. Sean, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. I'm Sean McLaughlin, uh, director of photography and editor of Bullets to Books. Um, uh, Andy reached out to me. Uh, we were old friends. We worked on a different project together years ago, and he reached out to see if I wanted to go to South Sudan. And um, it was a beautiful opportunity. Uh, of course, uh, you, the family was scared. Everybody was a little like, oh, you, you sure you want to go over there right now? And it's like, yeah, why not? It was one of the most gorgeous experiences uh, of my life, of our lives, I know. Um, it was it was very very wonderful um yeah and the thing that was so great about it like rather than like you could see some of the pictures that are flowing along you could just see one of the things we discovered when we got there was we kind of understood the resiliency of these people but it it became so humanized it always takes you to be in a location to see it so not only were there these gorgeous this gorgeous atmosphere like um the the flora and fauna whatever but you meet south sudanese people and there's some of the most open-hearted honest resilient people you'll ever meet and then once we got to like fully be in the school you saw that with the students didn't uh, do you remember anything specific sean like let, let's talk about these kids specifically too that this is going to help out I, I was blown away um, how brilliant these kids are. Um, they were way far ahead than um, what I've seen in the United States, at least in education. Um, like uh, these kids were uh, on a coll collegiate level uh, in what we would probably consider ninth grade. Um, the education over there uh, that Jacques has provided uh, blew me away. Um, it, it kind of made me a little ashamed of our education society, like in the United States. Um, or at least my, maybe our own two personal ones, maybe personal <laughs> ones. Yes. At least where I came from. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then also too, like you can see here through some of the images that just scrolled through. It, it was, it was such a raucous fun time. They were like just so welcoming of us to their campus that, oh man, we had such a fun time being able to flit in yeah. and out of their, their ceremony to welcome us. So it was just pure, honest, good time. And I, I can't thank Jock and his school enough. And just purely on that personal note, I'm, I've been fully invested in Sean as too to like figure out how we can sustain these new structures to be able yeah. to get this thing even moving forward so that he can reach out even more in his own country. It's, you know, it all starts with the seed of changing minds from bullets to books to eventually get to having that, not just at his school, but to multiple schools and multiple people out throughout the country. And we're more than proud to be able to be a part of it. Amen. Yeah, this I mean, and also too, just it, I hope you're really taking in some of these images, because it's just it was so fun capturing everything. But rather than keep, you know, talking uh, about our experience and explaining to you what it looks like, let's actually show it to you in our short documentary titled Bullets to Books.
we are under pressure. The most pressure that we receive is from our own constituencies as people of South Sudan. They will keep telling you, really want to have peace. localities of cattle raiding, revenge killings, a lot of those also on uh, tribal lines or community lines. We need to understand each other in terms of how to lift up the level of education and how to lift up even our uh, generation level. We need to give them how we can balance the life without that mindset that creates conflict. My name is Jock Abraham Thorn. I believe nothing is impossible. Something done by a human being can be changed by a human being. I can still make something. In 2017, I started a campaign changing mine from bliss to book. This is the only thing driving me. Born in 1990. In 1991, we had a very destructive and deadly attack on our village by the rebels. So we flew to Uganda, and this is how our life began as refugees. The situation I went through changed my life. It was because I saw that illiteracy is tearing the country apart. So I put down temporary structures. In 2016, I made a public announcement that we have a school here, a secondary school. So if your child is willing to come, let them come and register. 280 students were registered. Kids, the school kids here were abducted behind this mountain by a um, group, about five of them. And I, and I got a call that Abraham kids have been abducted when they were studying under the, the mango tree. We and the parents decided to, to go to the bush searching for them. Just only three people, the three kids, managed to come back by their own. Others were scrolling because they were really beaten up. And two went missing up to now and we thought they were thrown in the river because this is what we got from the ground. Having experienced that like one, one month in oppression because we opened the school in uh, February 5th and then this thing happened on the 23rd of March. And all this were happening because we didn't have the fence that to keep the children inside the school safe. We don't need people to think of seeing the school kids as their enemies. During times of conflict, you know, people don't get the opportunities to take care of themselves, you know. So in terms of feeding, they are fed by the international community in terms of maybe schooling, you know, they have all the supports and so on and so on. So they so much get used to handouts, you know, and then it becomes a very, very dangerous culture. That's not just bad for the country, you know, but even it has an impact in the neighboring countries and so on because people would always want to have uh, that cycle. Positive development over the past year was that um, the ceasefire that's holding because of this this peace agreement. The ceasefire gives South Sudanese and, and we um, people who want to see this country to a better future. It gives us some breathing space to try to tackle some of these much more difficult and in, enduring problems. We need more understanding uh, among each other to understand the value of the peace agreement and the value of the people also. Uh, so we can sacrifice, because if you didn't sacrifice to provide something delicious to your people, you're not going to feel satisfied and you're not going to have a rest of mind. From bullets to book, it's a good initiative because you will find uh, some families, they can't even afford the school fees for their children. 
many of these young people are so eager, they're so eager to learn. Coming up with an idea of uh, setting up a facility like the Promised Land gives an opportunity for very, very young people to try to further their education is something that that can't be done by everybody else. You know, a person like Jog realizes that there is a need, you know, and he's, uh, he sees the need. So you find people fighting for a war that they don't know while they're fighting their own brothers. Children are the most affected people in, in those conflicts. And this is why Blessed to Book and having this school in place will be the one biggest achievement ever. It's like now five years since they were constructed, temporary like this. There's too much water to make call up on them. We cannot blame the rooms because they have reached their limits. So. And it will be good to rescue this before the collapse because we do not have any other options. I constructed this building in 2015. And now the tamad the have also eaten the poles inside here. That make this wall more weaker. And it's a sign that it has come to an end. And you can see the bamboo is now all is eaten. This is the part of bamboo. They are moving in pieces. If we are lucky to get, it get to resist this rainy season, that can take us up to the end of the year. So we keep on adding to make stronger. When I get little money, I have to add it on. And hiring people that do this is really costly. This room is the oldest room. If something happened in this room and I have no option to do, then that, that means we have to close the things and then let them go home. Because I, I, I don't have anything now to, again to do it. It's a great effect to the community because they will have nowhere to go, and the kids will be left outside in the markets and having nothing to do. And that, is a, that will be a big, big blow to the community and the country at large. Because our aim is to keep them in school and try to mold them, inspire them, get education, encourage them to go to university and be able to set their own, their own life. But myself and the parents, when seeing this kid go to university, like, thank God, we are doing something. Hello, I'm Cindy Oxberry, and I'm a musician, music producer, director, and music educator in the performing arts, and a proud member of the Yiddishe Kulturbund project. I'm happy to say that I live one of Ambassador Hushik's statements he made in his opening remarks. I am a person-to-person -person relationship builder in my work and an ambassador for the performing arts. I primarily work in live arts, so taking that skill into JKP programming has been great fun. Gail invited me to become a part of the JKP, and I began working with her in 2018. And we worked in colleges here in the States presenting workshops. In 2019, I became a recipient of the MWF Reciprocal Exchange Component for Young African Leaders, and I headed to Juba, South Sudan in June. On the plane ride to Juba, I pulled out an index card that I had taken with me, which contained the JKP mission statement. Power of music and art, resiliency of the human spirit, will to survive. 
On my first day of many days of our performance education workshops, Gail and I began exploring issues of oppression. We met such interesting groups that had signed up for the workshop. Artists from Anna Taban and I Am Peace. We worked with a group from Jock's School, the Promised Land Secondary School, and also with a group from the organization Crown the Woman. We worked with elite entertainment artists from Juba, and we even led a workshop with the Intro to Documentary Filmmaking for Emerging Film Makers. We collected data information that allowed us to track how many people were taking these workshops, name, gender, age, and education levels. In Juba, we had over 100 people involved in our workshops. The workshop sheet, which helped us start, asked everyone to pick one prompt and then follow the instructions. The prompts were in three categories, use visual art, or use music, or use the written word. Each option had a roadblock or two thrown in to challenge what would limit them in some way, or as I like to think, would inspire them to try a different road and tap deeper into their imagination, a human resource that cannot be taken away from you. They had pens, paper, styrofoam coffee cups, and water bottles as potential tools to help them. They began creating something, and every person was involved. The Juba participants had a deep understanding of oppression because they had firsthand knowledge as a nation. The performance themes were overwhelming. Struggle, loss, guns, freedom, hope, liberation, and nationalism. Using lyrics and songs, poems and images, they turned pencils into drumsticks, water bottles into microphones, and the South Sudanese flag was drawn on coffee cups held high. One of my favorite groups was from the organization Crown the Woman. We divided the participants into three small groups. We challenged them to pick a prompt. I didn't have to do too much pulling to get the idea out of these young women. They were so enthusiastic. Within one hour, they had written lyrics, wrote a poem, and then performed it. Okay, hi guys. Uh, yeah, this team is called Lonely Girls. And we are going to sing a song, and that song is saying, Missing You. Yes. <laughs> After a time, I have to wait for you.
looked out at the young people that day and every day, I thought of my grandparents who arrived in America as young children, immigrants themselves, coming with one suitcase in their hand and hope in their heart for a better life. Their children, my mom and her siblings, were first-generation Americans who grew up in the Depression era in the 20th century. They were raised to be proud citizens of the United States of America. My personal background growing up, it was a struggle. My mama did everything she could to make sure her children thrived and helped with their education. So each day in Juba, I would come to the workshops and look out at them and say, I understand you and I honor your journey. I hope you will continue your education and make your nation better. I discovered that the students and young professionals we met in South Sudan want a better life for themselves and want their home to be their nation. They did succeed during those days of the workshops by digging deeper inside themselves to create and share a form of artistic expression outside themselves, all proud and full of hope. Thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Um, my name is Lupai. I am the founder of I Am Peace Initiative, and uh, I'm also um, an alumni for the Mandela Washington Fellowship 2018. I was in, in Kansas, an amazing place. Uh, and yeah, um, South Sudan is such a diverse country. It's diverse in so many ways uh, when it comes to its rich culture. Uh, but something that stands out is actually the resilience of its people. Now, most importantly, I want to talk about the different ways people raise their children. So we have two categories of kids. One, we have kids who go to school and we have kids who don't go to school. There are those who don't go to school on choice and there are those who, go to, who don't go to school just because uh, they don't have the means to go to school. But also one of the biggest challenges that affects children is the fact that a lot of them have been recruited as child soldiers uh, in the different armed struggles throughout the years, even in the recent 2013 and the recent 2016 crisis. And that has actually affected a lot uh, when it comes to the development uh, of our education system, the development of our children, and a lot. So in 2018, I was uh, privileged, of course, to attend the Mandela Washington Fellowship, where I learned a couple of leadership skills on how I can move IMPs forward and put all the ideas I had into perspective. And so when you look at the two different pictures that, that, first, uh, that we are shown up there, one, you see kids who wear army uniforms, and you see kids who, who wear school uniforms. And so this shows the two distinct kinds of kids. And ask myself, I ask myself, how can I make sure that I make South Sudan the kind of country that I admire? How do I make South Sudan the kind of country that diversity is celebrated and not used to torture and hunt each other? How can I make South Sudan the place that everybody would want to visit and not be like Sean, whose family at the end of the day was worried how he was going to get here and how safe he was going to be? I want a South Sudan that everybody would admire. But how can we get that South Sudan that everyone would admire? Now, looking at the way the world evolves, we always know that children are the people who, who build up the generation that we want. So if you give a very good foundation to these children, we have a better generation. You give a very bad foundation to these children, give them the arms, that means we shall have yet another generation of people whose mindset are inclined into conflict. And so how can we roll out this kind of perspective where children are taught to hold the guns and rather roll that out and have a, a country where children are given the pen? Instead of the bullet, you're given the book. Instead of the gun, you're given the pen. And so IMP has always worked so hard every single day to ensure that we build more people-to-people -people relationship, but also we advocate for peaceful coexistence through different ways. And one of the ways for us to achieve peace as a country 
is of course to advocate for education. Now, we know that when we advocate for education, we shall have a literate uh, a generation of, 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 of people who will first have to discern before they act, who will first have to think before they act, who will first have to be careful whatever they say, whatever they do before they act. And that generation can never be built if we don't build strong educational institutions. Now, when you look at what's happening around, there's a lot of budget that every year is being rolled out, and you see very little efforts that are being put to actually support education system. Could the people be, um, can I say, could the people have uh, forgotten about education or do they put education as a priority? No, they put protection, security as a priority, not knowing that the more they arm people, the more we will have generations and generations of people who will always have a mindset of conflict. So as I am peace, I was excited to meet Jock. And I met Jock actually through the Mandela Washington Fellowship before we traveled to, to the United States in 2018. But afterwards, his story and my story are all gearing towards the same thing. And that is the peace that we want in our country. Although he is directly having that by building schools, one thing is us advocating more for a lot of efforts to be put on education. Now, how can we do that? So as IMPs, we have a lot of platforms that we use. We have a lot of platforms that we use to advocate for social change. And we use music, we use media, and uh, we also use other community outreach activities. And we also use a lot of other arts, including uh, films and, and, um, and, 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 and theater and all that. Now, looking at all these structures, I was excited when Jock shared with me about meeting Gail Prinsky in the United States, who I was more interested the fact that she was actually working around arts. That was one of the platforms that we use. So how do we bring arts and education together? How can we use these two tools to ensure that we advocate for the change that we need as a country? And so after having a lot of conversations through the help of the U.S. Embassy and also through the help of Adrian from uh, the State Department, we connected uh, with, with Gail and Jock, and we had a lot of conversations. And when they came to Juba, our first mission was like, how could we use arts to advocate for education in this country, to create a change in mindsets from bullets to books? And that is a key basis to us coming out with a song, which is now a theme song of this whole idea, we call it the whole global transformers idea called Bullets to Books. And so these Bullets to Books bring different South Sudanese from across uh, different regions. And all the artists you see there are not South Sudanese from maybe one region, because first to create that diversity, we also don't need to create it only other sectors. Also, we need to close that in the, um, uh, sorry, I learned out of light there. <laughs> but we have to also do that in, um, uh, in, the art, in the art sector. So sorry, I learned out of light, but here it is, the Bullets to Books music video. And this is a music video that we produced here in Juba. And also uh, in the background, if you could get Cindy's voice, you could also get, I think, uh, Andy's voice. Uh, they also gave a little backup in the music. And that was a whole collaboration among us South Sudanese artists here. But also, I would say it was a huge collaboration with JK as well. So hey, let's have a watch and look at the Bullets to Books video, speaking a lot about how South Sudanese need to change their mindsets from Bullets to Books and send more children to school. Bullets and guns cannot make a change. Pen and paper can't bring the change. You better change your mind. We are the change that we need to see. Education is the key, our youth is our strength, you and I, we are the change. It's about time that I stay conscious, whoa, whoa, and be focused that one day we're gonna make it. No, nobody's keeping, while I'm missing, say no for bullet, no for bullet, while I'm missing, say yes for bullet, la, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Use a pencil. Change your mind, change your mind. You better change your mind, change your mind, change your mind. You better change your mind, change your mind, change your mind. You better change your mind, change your mind, change your mind. You better change your mind. 
mind changes that mean life changes in this new age i feel the ice breaking i'm not afraid of even dark places it's one wall there are no races bullets to book books no bullets i was standing up for the people i don't know i was doing right for the people i don't know why complicate the life one simple mean tal gele tenia maderin ma shakir tani mara mean tal gele tenia ما في حاجه دير جنوره مين طالقه لكان ميا كلني انا رابابيل انا كردنا ما كرب غروس في بيدا بابا ابن تكون مداري ساسان بلد برابا جدا سي لاغو بتغالم ايديكيشن از ذا كي تو ذا ريل سلام ما في داعي لمشاكل ليس فوجيت اند فوجيف على سيل ذا اسيل يا واي سبيند ماني اون ارمز لي غو في جانو ما في اكل about the rumor that the killing every day don't listen to the people saying that this is on the way we all need to know that education is the way on the way you the way let's throw the guns away this is the time don't wait to be told this is the time to rise and move on don't sit down waiting for things to be done get up we move on and let's get things done tell me what you wanna do for me change is what i wanna do tell me what you wanna do I wanna change bullet to paper Education is a right for every child Let's give them a chance to read and write No child is meant to die Give pens don't give them guns This is story that I wanna change Join hands and make a story change They could hide your side to be let na day It's a day we will see let on the lay Kalashile yall and the desa Bukura haya to mon be come better Change your mind change your mind Change your mind You better change your mind Better not change your mind You better change your mind Change your mind Change your mind You better change your mind Change your mind You better change your mind Change your mind Change your mind Change your mind Fast and I write to school. Wait a minute. Always can happen. Always can happen. If you build a school for them to learn. Hello everyone. So I am Mercedes and uh, what I do as an artist is I take guns, bullet casings, firearms and I melt them down and transform them into uh, musical installations, musical instruments and public works of art. And so what I really want to do as an artist is I want to take the very materiality of violence and turn it into its opposite, turn it into something which is beautiful, which is peaceful. um and which is really uh the very the very opposite of what a gun or a bullet casing could ever be um and so the video i'm about to show you is me melting down a Sig Sauer MCX rifle which is the exact rifle that was used during the Orlando Pulse Club shooting and uh as a gay latina woman i really felt like i so easily could have been in that club um and it really transformed my 
my path as a creative. And, uh, and so I decided to take this, you know, this massive assault rifle and melt it down and turned it into 49 Liberty Bells for the 49 individuals who lost their lives that night. In honor of those who died from the Orlando Pulse Club massacre, I melted down a six-hour MCX rifle, the exact rifle that was used during the tragedy, and using that aluminum from the assault weapon, I made 49 Liberty Bells for each of the victims who died. So what I do as an artist is very different than uh, a lot of activists per se. However, as an artist, what I can do is I can visually represent what so many activists uh, want to do. I personally cannot change policies. However, I can show that it is possible to melt down guns and melt down bullets to make these beautiful objects, um, which is everything that Bullets to Books and this project represents. And that's why when I met Gail, um, we both realized that in so many ways, my, my practice mirrored what, what Bullets to Books and what Jock was trying to do. Um, and so the, the following sculpture is a book, which is uh, cast out of melted bullets. It's currently in the Charney Smilton Community Bookstore here in Anacostia. DC, and it's honoring the life of Charney Smilton. She was a DC-based journalist who lost her life to gun violence. And so similarly to this project, the bookstore is really trying to get bullets off the streets and to promote education. And, uh, and so one of the things that I would like to do in collaboration with Bullets to Books is to cast a large public art, sculpt public art sculpture at Jock School that would be... Um, uh, that would be cast in a ceremony in which everyone would come together and melt bullets to, to make this beautiful and large uh, sculpture of a book, which symbolizes how it is possible to take the very materiality of violence and, and turn it into a book. Uh, and uh, another thing that I will be doing with Bullets to Books is that I will be melting down bullet casings, uh, the vast majority of which come from the DC Department of Forensic Science, and I will be um, casting uh, bricks or building blocks, and uh, Bullets to Books will be selling them to raise money um, for this project. So thank you so much, everyone. Okay, I think we're back to me. Um, this has been really inspiring for me. Um, it's a great reminder about the Bullets to Books initiative and all the outgrowths of it, um, whether it's Mercedes artwork, uh, IMP performances. Um, this is really the specific example that I hope uh, proves my general assertion about the value of people to people diplomacy and exchange programs. Americans can and should be proud of of our government's work in places like South Sudan. This is, this is work funded by our taxes and it reflects American generosity. Um, and by the way, um, I think you can also take some pride in, in the great work that the UN does in South Sudan. Um, they have the world's largest peacekeeping operation and the largest food security programs in, in Africa. So, uh, which won uh, a Nobel Peace Prize this year. So you know that these UN programs are also highly funded by the by the United States, and these are all tremendously important initiatives. But years of experience uh, leave me convinced, and I probably you after watching this, that the best investments we make are not necessarily the biggest, um, and never underestimate the real and lasting value of people-to-people -people diplomacy in action. 
So today's web event brought back good memories of Gail and Cindy's exchange visit to Juba. Um, I'm sorry we had some bit audio problems with um, with Jock being able to describe Promised Land School. I can tell you my own visit there was really inspiring. I attended on awards day. And this was, I think, three years into Jock's school. He had students who received the top awards, boy and girl, in the entire country of South Sudan for graduating seniors. I mean, the quality of that school is amazing. And, um, and with this new building that um, you see plans for, it's going to be even, even better. This is what the country needs. I also remember um, attending performances of I Am Peace. And for those of you way back in my generation, this is uh, reminiscent of Michael Jackson's We Are the World. This is bringing together a collaboration of all the best artists in, um, in South Sudan, mostly singers, but also I remember some stand-up comedians and, and other artists. Um, it really is was quite the collaboration and and um, that video should go viral for sure. So um, I'm confident that these are the programs that will secure a real future for South Sudan and keep the connections between South Sudanese and Americans very strong. So I recognize it's not easy for most people to simply hop on a plane bound for South Sudan or really anywhere during the pandemic, right? But for those of you who don't have the opportunity to visit in person, I hope you got a glimpse of the impact of, from these initiatives during today's event. And so let me give a shout out to those who organized um, this online opportunity today, everyone behind the scene and on screen that helped pull this off. It really is um, what I come to expect from the bullets to books people. So in wrapping up, I wanted to highlight a couple of themes and maybe pose a couple of stray suggestions that I believe uh, uh, came out of uh, what we heard here today. First, at the risk of repeating myself, uh, people to people diplomacy is the best investment we can make to tackle even the most daunting challenges, such as building a lasting peace and prosperity for the next generation of South Sudanese. Stick with it. Um, second, I want to um, just say that Jock and, um, and Moses' plans for the school, they just described really a fraction of the difficulties faced um, in, by Promised Land School. If anything, they've really understated the challenges posed by the South Sudan Sudanese context, where the government has severely underfunded education and where more than 2 million children across the nation are without any opportunity to go to school. I think Lupai mentioned some of that as well. In that light, the, the value of Promised Land School and other citizen-led cultural and education initiatives really can't be overstated. Another point, um, keep your eye out for opportunities to meet South Sudanese here at home in America. Take advantage of our country's heritage of diversity and generosity towards refugees and other immigrants. You may very well have South Sudanese or Janubi Americans, as I call them, living in your own communities. Look around, they're probably the tallest people in the room or at your local churches or in your neighborhood schools. So reach out to them, start practicing people to people diplomacy even at home. And then one more point to close on, and it's a lesson I've learned um, by watching today and also from a lifelong career as an American diplomat. And that is that people to people diplomacy is as valuable for America and for the Americans as it is to our partners, such as the South Sudanese people. I, I myself have always learned so much more about American values, generosity and strength by seeing these traits reflected back from friends overseas. These are uh, people to people projects we heard about today are a clear demonstration of hope, of hard work, of humility. These are um, values that a lot of Americans uh, mistakenly believe to be uniquely American. But as you can see, they are traits and values shared by the best of our South Sudanese friends and really by friends around the world. And that's what people to people diplomacy is all about. So again, congratulations to everybody who put this event together today. Thanks and back over to Gail, I think. Ambassador, thank you so much. You really, uh, you know how to rock this for sure. Um, one of the one of the challenges we also have is the internet, and we have to find ways to help support um, Jock and and the community there in order for us to continue doing good work uh, in cultural 
exchange efforts. Um, Jock, if you are able, I know that your your um, your videos kind of dark, but I think you are on audio. And if you can unmute, I'd like to ask you a question. So can you can you say hello? Hello. Oh, great. Okay. So, Jock, you know, we're, we're hoping that you're going to come back to the U.S. Uh, and hopefully in autumn. Can you talk a little bit about your vision for efforts that you hope will do when you're here? Well, thank you so much, Gail Prinsky and uh, all the listeners of this amazing program. I'm really excited to join. My name is Jock Abram Pond. Uh, I'm the founder of Promised Land Secondary School. Uh, regarding the question, I'm really excited to answer that question because it has been my dream to inspire the generation of the young people. My call has been how do we inspire the young people to be the change makers in their societies who can be able to build the future they want and the future that is more peaceful for the younger generation to come. So when we talk about bullet to book in regards to the global effort, my idea is to bring together the people around the world to focus on how dangerous is our invention into guns. The world has really grown so fast into growing the culture of guns. So my idea, when, I, when I'm in the US, I'll be able to speak to young students, the kids, on how to realize how important they are to one another, the importance of humanity. I'm one of the people who believe that the world can be a peaceful place when we cherish or when we value ourselves. Every groundbreaking invention comes when there is one person that has decided to live beyond his or her imagination. So I will restore hope in the lives of the young people in the U.S. and across the world to know we are in the world that needs our invention, that needs all our ideas to make it a peaceful one for all of us. Take, for example, the school shooting, early uh, child marriages in Africa, yeah, child soldiers in Africa, when I speak to, into their hearts and to their soul, I hope they will be able to return themselves to the humanity call. That means they will denounce all the forms of guns affiliated activities to good ideas of education. Thank you, girl. Thank you, Jock. We're going to come back to you for more questions, but I wanted to ask Moses if he can speak about his ideas for phasing in the design and construction plans at Promised Land Secondary School. Moses, can you unmute? Uh, hello? We can see you. Yeah, and, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I'm sorry to admit that. Yeah. Um. Architect Moses. Uh, the architect working alongside with the uh, Jock Abraham, the founder of Ramsland uh, Secondary School. Uh, as an architect, I've been tasked and uh, working in this context and looking at Jock School falling off, being infested with the termites. I kept to challenge myself: What do I do as an architect from South? Sudan? And in my line of practice, I always have to work hand in hand with the client or the users to meet their aspirations and dreams. And uh, based on that, the uniqueness of any design is based on its uh, mission. And good enough, uh, Jock has a mission for the school, bullets to books. Then my task is how do I tend to create a space that changes people's mindset? Redivert them from thinking about bullets and fighting, shooting, and thinking of how to unite themselves, socialize, and uh, based on the diversity of our culture around in South Sudan. 
there are many cultures around, there are many tribes, but how do they to create that space that unifies, how brings that uh, sense of togetherness to the students? So uh, in the design, you can see we created a number of spaces, a number of nooks and, and porches that uh, allow students to read either in groups or individual, where they can socialize, talk to each other, reflect on their diversity, and create that sense of togetherness. Uh, the building as well has to uh, play a bigger role in terms of sustainability. When I look at the roofing itself, uh, I designed it in a way that it has to be cheap in construction and as well in its use. And uh, when I look at the, in terms of harvesting rainwater, it's uh, cheaper as yes, we collect water from only two directions than having gutters all around the building. So we can collect a lot of hot water, we can collect a lot of water, and uh, it, we can easily install uh, solar panels on top of it that it can easily gain an energy from throughout the day. So that's a big win. And in terms of the phasing of the project, you know, we are working within, within a limited uh, budget. Uh, the finance is our greatest setback. But uh, I think amid is the financial setback, we have a million design options that we can test. And uh, that has really helped us to see what we can do with the limited resources we have. Uh, we have a lot of compromises, but it doesn't have to change the design. And uh, that's what we have worked on, and it is really working out. As we see from the design and the master plan, we have a number of spaces, and one of which is the administration, uh, laboratory, and the library block, which within the limited resources we have, we have tried to see how we can, in the meantime, use this block as classrooms, and indeed we are succeeding. Uh, though we have not gone far, but uh, we have really tried to uh, change a certain function of the laboratories and the administration block into classrooms, and it has really given wider classrooms uh, that are well aerated. When look at the windows, still complete, but the windows show that uh, the, the building will be naturally ventilated, and the the light will be natural lighting, actually. So that thing of sustainability and cutting down the uh, running cost of the building is completely cut down. So uh, the design is coming out, and the biggest uh, achievement we are looking into is uh, engaging uh, the local community into the project to create that sense of ownership. Uh, from the construction, you can see we got some locals around the uh, school uh, in the construction and some few students who are for break, working as well with the team on site. And uh, with that, then they can create that ownership, like this is our school. We own the school, they can protect the school, love it and take care of it. So uh, that's one thing that uh, we, we have to celebrate as a project, because this project has to give back to the users. Uh, about the materials, uh, it's basically materials that have been sourced from Juba, uh, with a few of the steel that maybe is imported, but uh, we are still looking for ways to make uh, sure that the materials we use are, are really locally, locally sourced and locally made and using the local workmanship. Uh, when you look at the excavation of the foundation, these are people from within. So the school has to train them as well in uh, impacting them with the skills and how they can use this skill aftermath of this construction of the school. So I think uh, the school is not only to benefit uh, the concerns not only to benefit from this land, but as well the community and the country at large, as we are going to also to build their skills and the capacities. So uh, within the uh, limited budget, we have done a lot uh, so far, but we are still hoping to do much as we are to more funding and uh, job is as well committed. And with this commitment, we are inspired and all our American friends who are working um, nights, days and nights to make sure things happen for promised land. And indeed, together, we can let to the promised land ourselves. So yeah, uh, thank you so much. And this is uh, Architect Mokas Spring from Juba. Thank you, Moses. That was super great. Um, so now I want to uh, ask a question, perhaps, to Jock and Lupai, if possible. Um, it's complicated in South Sudan in terms of the effort of unifying the people. There are 64 tribes in a country of about 11 million people. So how do you envision education 
in the effort to unify and bring peace among so many groups of people. Um, Jock and Lupai, can you have a little conversation with us about that? Yeah, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Yeah, this is a great question. You know, when we talk about uh, unifying a country, uh, first of all, we need to have uh, a civilized society. A civilized society that being a society that has a role or that feel they belong to the society they are in. And that society can be brought up from education. That means we need to create a generation that is more educated to understand issues around them and issues that affect the world at large. And why I believe in a civilized society is because they focus on productive businesses. That means they will be engaged in activities that are more beneficial to humanity, but not activities that destroy humanity. When you look at the case of South Sudan and Africa, you find democracy has been affected or intimidated by uneducated young people who are exploited or used to stop democracy. And because of their illiteracy, they don't know that their wrong behavior is the one that has stopped them to have good hospitals. Their unwillingness to, to be part of the democracy is what has stopped them from having good roads. So when I talk about education in solving um, conflict, I am a living example because the way I see things is not the way some other illiterate young people see. I believe in peaceful coexistence to achieve my dreams. And the other young people that are not educated believe in conflict as the way of achieving their dreams too. So education will set the young people free to be independent thinkers, to be global transformers. And this is why you see Africa is less performing in global affairs because the young people are deeply into their tribes, they are deeply into their countries, but they're not open-minded to see what are the other challenges facing the world and how they can be part of it. So bullet to book is one of the examples because it will highlight the young people's role to see their roles in the global affairs, to be global transformers. And we use education like the promised land secondary school to change that. Now we have about 300 young people who are now in the university. And this year, 2021, we are going to graduate 182 candidates. And these people will not go back to the communities empty-handed. They'll go back filled with knowledge, filled with fresh ideas, and independent thinkers in their societies, and advocates of peaceful coexistence. When we talk about arts, illiteracy also doesn't allow arts. And music, because in South Sudan we have music. But when the music speaks from the heart of the illiterate person, it speaks bitterly. It is so tribalistic. It is not unifying. So we need to reach out the, the message of peaceful coexistence through music and art. And that's what Lupaya has been talking before. Musicians and artists are good peace ambassadors because their messages speak directly to the arts of the beneficiaries. The action of art speaks louder. And this is why Culture Born Project is one of the most powerful collaborations that I enjoy 
or as I have benefited as many young South Sudanese people. Because now, seeing when Gail came to South Sudan, so many young people realized their dreams. They realized their talents. They were able to set up uh, the old uh, films, uh, production studios, producing local films. And when young people start to tell stories uh, of other people, I think art speaks better than uh, better than anything. So I will turn the mic to Mike uh, to Lupai uh, to tell us more about what he thinks on the other aspect because he's from I am peace and all of us we are I am peace and we all yearn for peace. Yeah, I am peace. So. Uh... I'm very sure everyone here is uh, uh, is my mic on. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So I hope I hope everyone here is uh, is following that uh, slogan as well. You have to be peace. So uh, back to your question. We we are currently running a project called Peace Pen and Pass, and we're doing this in schools and is supported by the U.S. Embassy here in Juba. Uh, Peace Pen and Pass helps us to reach out to to students and teach them some conflict resolution uh, skills and leadership skills, and. And this this helps us to to get to learn more about students when they are in a school setup, apart from what the teachers usually tell us. Uh, how can this promote uh, peaceful coexistence? So one thing I want to get back to what uh, Ambassador uh, Tom said: uh, building people to people. You call it diplomacy. I say build, building people to people relationships, and that actually is a basis for building trust. And school environments are one of the biggest platforms people use to build trust among themselves because it brings people from different uh, uh, communities, from different tribes together. So they, they learn under the same roof. They are being taught by the same people, and so that alone, as you build trust based on, uh, 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 as you build, build trust and break stereotypes it becomes easier for you to discern that whatever you get out of the school environment might not might not be something that you believe in. You already have a mindset that is different based on uh, what you get in school. So someone from a particular community might have a different view uh, uh, about another one from a particular community, but if they're in the same setup, you find that they already have that trust, they already have um, built that relationship, and they start to, to question certain ideas that are being pushed to keep people apart. And so, in that setup of an education system, maybe like in a school setup, people build that trust and relationship among themselves. But in general, it's always very hard for people to discern, like from my first statement I made, it's very hard for people to discern uh, whether or not they are being uh, taken to the promised land, if I use that, or they're actually being used. The only way they can know they're going to the promised land is when they're enlightened. It's when they can reason for themselves. It's when they have the ability to read for themselves and not just hear what people say for them to do it. And I think without education, we can't achieve that. And so I believe that pushing for education, uh, and it's what a lot of us here, including some other activists, are pushing on to increase the budget on education, to ensure that the budget that has been allocated is fully given, to ensure that there are a lot of available schools for people to attend. And pushing this, first of all, gives children an alternative for a space to learn rather than just thinking about, all right, I am home. School is very far from, from my location. I think I just don't need to go to school. I just need to go and take care of cattle. I just need to go and uh, a farm. I just need to go and do whatever I need to do. But the fact that there's a school that is available next to you, first of all, that in itself is an encouragement. So as we keep on advocating for education, as we keep on advocating for, uh, for better schools and better systems in our structures, that in one way is 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 a strategy for us to build trust among ourselves and also uh, open mindsets of those who might have already been um, blocked. If that makes sense, Kyle. Lupai, that made a lot of sense. I I it's so powerful, so powerful. I have a question now for Andy, director of the documentary film that we did, and I hope that we will. Do more. So I wanted to ask Andy to describe the vision for the feature documentary we are hoping to produce. 
Yeah, of course, you know, uh, everyone had their lives interrupted by COVID. And so it's, you know, not an uncommon story to hear that that's how this all started, where we had to modify our approach. So first of all, we just knew that we had enough material to at least start getting the message out there. Our our meth methodology or how we wanted to approach this was purely let's put a lens up to this beautiful method um, to changing minds from bullets to books. But from there, what we wanted to do, we knew that there had to be some sort of conclusion. And the way that we perceive this to be able to move forward is we want to get Jock in the context of coming here to the United States. And we wanted to be able to see his mission it lands on the ears of American. Um, and also, too, just like to be able to see that method, that methodology that Jock runs by, his motto, spread further. To be able to capture that for the first time, it's going to be a beautiful thing to approach when hopefully that happens in the fall, like, like you were saying before, Gail, um, in any way possible to continue this message and to get it on film. Thanks, Andy. I think we are, we don't have any time for more questions. So I just want to ask Jock to help me thank everyone for, for joining us today and to the team. I have this incredible Bullets to Bullets team. Again, I want to thank our guest, Ambassador Hushek. I want to thank the American Impact Award, Mandela Washington Fellowship, the State Department. We are so well taken care of, and we need all of the support to push forward this extraordinary global transforming project. And please do contact us. I think that we have a screen that we can share um, so that you can easily contact us. Stand by just for a second. There it is. So if you want to, you can hold up your smartphone and scan in the QR code. And you can also write down our email address. So let's just take a minute for everybody to pull out their phones and do that. And I think uh, we hope that you will share this. This uh, program has been recorded. So please uh, share the link with others. And I hope in the future we can come back together and have more discussions. I really, really want to thank everyone. And I appreciate your time today. Yeah. And now. Uh... I would like to say thank you so much for all those uh, who joined us today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Lushe, for this remarkable uh, speech you have given. And thank, uh, thanks to all the Bullet to Book family, not forgetting the IREX and the US Department of State for a great opportunity that they have given us. This message of Bullet to Book need more advocacy because our world need Bullet to Book now, not tomorrow. And we need to be global transformers. And I ask all of you to be ambassadors of bullet book in your societies so that we make our world a better place for us now and for the future to come. Thank you so much, everyone who joined us today. May God bless you. Mm -hmm.